Coal-powered energy is two things, dirty and reliable. And now in Oregon, it's no more. It's bittersweet. The story of Oregon's last coal plant that just closed down for good. The story of our homeless crisis is one fundamentally about people. 2,000 people estimated to be sleeping on the streets of Multnomah County. I meet new people probably every day. Why so many of them have set up camp so close to Vancouver and helping you keep up with the down ballot. Tonight, Portland Commissioner Chloe Udaly and challenger Mingus Maps and how they hope to win your vote. Here's the story. And I'm Dan Haggerty. Using my news voice tonight. Hi, welcome to the story. Hey, we're gonna be answering some of your questions tonight on the show, so if there's something bubbling up there that you, you, just, you, you, you need us to hear, you, you want us to answer, it's simple. Bubble it down onto your computer or onto your phone. Facebook, you can find me there. Just search Dan Haggerty KGW. You can email us at the story at kgw.com or as always use Twitter and that hashtag hey Dan. I hope you had a relaxing and uneventful weekend because it's Monday now and time to get back to 2020. So let's go to the big story. And it may be big, but it's pretty straightforward. There are officially no more coal plants in Oregon. None. Zero. Zilch. Not all gone. PGE's Boardman coal plant was the very last one. And as of last Thursday, it's gone. It's shut down for good. After four decades of churning out reliable but dirty power, it was the single biggest source of greenhouse gas pollution in Oregon. But, you know, it also employed a lot of people and it powered a whole lot of homes. Pat Doris explains how we're going to keep the lights on. The super hot furnace that burned an enormous amount of coal over 40 years near Boardman, Oregon, is dark tonight. It was the only place in the state where coal was burned to make electricity. The owner, Portland General Electric, shut it down for good in mid-October. I visited the plant in October of 2019, which is why you won't see anyone wearing COVID masks or socially distancing in this video. One of the workers sorry to see Boardman go was there at the beginning, Dave Bowles. Wintertime, summertime, when they really need the power, we're always running. We're there, you know, so it's been knowing that We've been providing this for Portland General Electric and the, the city of Portland, basically. All electricity, good personal pride in that accomplishment. Coal plants are dirty for the environment, but they are also dependable, much more dependable than wind or solar or hydro sources. Yet major utilities are making the move to those renewables, pressured by consumers, lawsuits, and cheaper renewable energy. Still, the Boardman shutdown was no doubt a sad day, for the 110 employees who worked here when it was fully staffed. So what's it like having Boardman officially closed now? Well, I think for the employees at the plant and, and many people who have worked with the Boardman plant at PGE over the course of the last 40 years, um, it's bittersweet. Spokesman Steve Corson points out the utility and its workers knew the end was coming for the past 10 years after PGE agreed to the shutdown as part of an environmental lawsuit with the Sierra Club. Sasha Kearns battles coal around the Northwest for the Sierra Club and told me last year it is important to shut down this plant. And so when you think about the entirety of the nation's coal fleet, it's pretty significant to have a, the only coal plant that exists in Oregon to be coming offline. You couldn't tell by looking at the smokestack, but the Boardman coal plant did pump out between 1.5 and 2 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. All of it invisible. That made it the single biggest point of greenhouse pollution in Oregon. But it's also tiny when you consider worldwide carbon emissions from coal plants in 2018 totaled 10 gigatons. That's 10 billion metric tons. Isn't that just a drop in the ocean? Well, you might think about a drop in the ocean, but the ocean is comprised of drops, right? And so when you think about the entirety of the nation's coal fleet, it's pretty significant to have uh, the only coal plant that exists in Oregon to be coming offline. And a coal plant is comprised of tons of coal. Boardman burned a special low sulfur coal to cut down on pollution. The plant went through lots of it, five and a half tons a minute when it was running. Boardman typically had 500,000 tons on the ground waiting to burn. You can see there, especially on the left side of the picture, it's nearly all gone now. The coal was brought in using trains 100 cars long from the Powder River Basin Mines in southeast Montana and northeast Wyoming. When you hold it, it feels surprisingly light, sort of like pieces of burned wood left over in a fireplace. 
Inside the plant, machines pulverize it into a fine powder. Then it's sprayed into a boiler, it's a big furnace, where it burns and heats water up above. The heated water turns into steam, which spins a turbine that turns a generator and makes electricity. When the plant was running full out, as it was when I toured in 2019, it created enough power for 500,000 homes each moment that it's running. Now that power source is gone. It's a, a big gap to fill, but it is one that we're confident that we can fill, both in terms of the, the near term, the resources that we've got lined up now, and over that longer term as well. PGE will buy extra hydropower over the next five years to replace that lost coal power. It's still working on what happens after that. Boardman is the first but not the last coal plant to close in the West. Over eight years, 12 plants will shut down, taking down enough dependable coal electricity to power 3.8 million homes. Instead, the power companies will rely on renewable resources, which will be good for the environment, but not nearly as dependable. Experts say we will have a one in four chance of blackouts by the year 2026. Pat Doerr is joining us now. So Pat, two questions right off the bat. What happens to the people who work there? Are they, do they all get laid off? And then secondly, kind of a broader, what does this mean for the average PGE customer? Are they going to notice anything on their bill? What, what will people notice from their homes now that this plan is closed? Okay, first thing on the employees, they've known this is coming for 10 years and there were about 110 people working there when it was at its height. About a third of those uh, have moved on to other jobs. There are other people who are retiring and there's going to be maybe 20 or so, uh, it's my understanding, who are going to be laid off. There are still people working there right now as they continue to decommission it. Sometime in 2021, by the way, they're going to turn it over to a demo company and the whole place is going to be torn down. Uh, now, as far as customers, I'm told the customers won't see this on their bills right away because Boardman did have a cost associated with it, uh, and those costs are going to go away, but there's a new cost of finding the power to replace the Boardman coal energy. And so um, it's unclear exactly where that all shakes out yet. So we don't know if bills are going to go up, if they're going to go down, if they're going to stay the same. Um, and Correct. there seems to be a lot of kind of unknowns, and here we are closing this plant. So the plan is moving forward with a lot of unknowns on the horizon. Is there a fear that maybe this is all happening too quickly or are those just the types of risks you have to take if you want to move forward um, and start operating with cleaner energy? Well, it's a great question. And the answer is it depends on who you ask. There are some who say we are going way too fast and we are rushing headlong into rolling blackouts because in the dead of winter, when the wind's not blowing and the temperatures are cold and people are demanding more energy for their furnaces, we can have some problems. Uh, and in the middle of the summer, same thing, when you have a scorching heat wave and the wind's not blowing and there's not very much water to run the hydro, uh, there are a lot of folks who say there could be trouble. On the other side, there are people who say, look, we are really quickly ruining this planet that we live on. And if we don't do something immediate and drastic to get these greenhouse gases under control, it's going to be too late. Some people saying it's kind of sort of already too late. And so there's a big belief that the engineers will figure things out as far as battery storage or storing water and having reusable hydro, that kind of thing. Uh, and that we might as well go to the future now because there is lots of sun when the sun is shining. There's lots of wind when the wind's blowing. The key is, can you harvest it and save it for when it's not happening? Okay. The pressure is on. Hopefully it creates innovation. Pat, thank you. Yeah, you bet. My pleasure. All right. Time now for an update on voter turnout. The Oregon Secretary of State says that they've received 88,406 ballots in Oregon so far, or 3% of our nearly 3 million registered voters. And a full two-thirds of those are from Multnomah County. They have recorded 59,968 ballots there alone. That is nearly 40,000 more than this time in 2016. That means a record number of Portland voters have probably already weighed in on the race between these two people. Current Portland City Commissioner Chloe Udaly and challenger Mingus Maps. A recent OPB DHM research poll has Maps up right now nine points over Udaly, 35% to 26%, with 6% undecided. So I guess this is for those 6% uh, of you, those undecided voters. We have yet to have either Commissioner Udaly or Maps on the story, but they were recently on Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. And since so many people are in the process of voting right now, we want to help you pick between these two. Let's start with the 
challenger, Mingus Maps. He actually used to work under Commissioner Udaley and has criticized how City Hall works together. He's also taken some heat because of the Portland Police Association endorsing him and donating $15,000 to his campaign. One of the first questions that Laurel asked Maps is whether that support will affect his decision making if he's elected. His basic answer was, they endorsed me, I didn't endorse them. Listen here. I cannot be bought uh, um, by this, you know, I'm an African American. I'm the only person in this race who knows what it's like to be a black man raising black children in Portland. I know what it's like to be pulled over by cops and not sure how things are going to uh, turn out. Um, I know what it's like to feel fear as you send your kids outside, hoping both that nothing bad happens to them and also hoping that they can uh, rely on the police department if something bad does happen. Uh, um, so those are uh, um, important concerns. Um, I believe that we need to reinvent policing from the top to bottom here. Um, I have and will push the police union to make changes. A good example of a change that I'll push for, um, and I think I've already made progress on getting the police department to think differently on, is um, the use of police to be our first responders on mental health issues. Something like 49% of our 911 calls um, basically are about sending out a cop to respond to some houseless person who's having a mental health crisis in a public space. I think that's bad public service. Uh, um, we need to get out of that business and sending, instead of sending a cop, we should send a mental health uh, worker. Our um, street response pilot program, which we're working on out in Lentz, is a good alternative model. Um, I'm going to push to expand that uh, program citywide. Now, beyond policing, MAPS agrees with newly elected Commissioner Dan Ryan that Portland's commission style of government needs to change. He also supports adding seats to city council. Now, let's turn to the incumbent, Chloe Udaly. She used her four years in office to fight for renters and limiting rent hikes. In the past, that advocacy has put her at odds with neighborhood groups and landlords. Now, on top of the fact that many renters, renters don't actually have to pay rent right now during the pandemic if they come under hard conditions, Laurel asked Udaly if she's doing anything to help out those landlords and homeowners as well. From the get-go, I've recognized what a catastrophe this is going to be for not just tenants, but landlords and, and homeowners uh, living in their own homes as well. Uh, we are going to see a wave of evictions and foreclosures, displacement and homelessness if uh, the city, state and federal governments do not uh, rise to the, this occasion and deliver really significant relief. Um, so when I talk about rent and mortgage forgiveness, that necessarily comes along with relief to landlords and lenders. We don't have the resources or really the power locally to ensure that. And we really need our state and federal uh, partners to act. So. The moratorium, you know, we are in an unprecedented um, public health crisis. We can't afford to have thousands of people evicted, pushed out onto the street uh, just for the overall safety of our whole community. But we absolutely can't solve this problem on the backs of landlords. I've never suggested that. I'm, I'm fighting for everyone in this moment because it's clearer now than ever that we're really are all, all in the same boat. We might not be in the same class uh, section, but we are all in the same boat. Now, of course, Laurel spent a lot of time, a lot more than we just showed you there with both candidates. And you can watch the entire conversations, and you should if you still are in that, that boat of undecided people. It's on the KGW YouTube channel right now. While you're there, hopefully you hit subscribe. We've got a lot of other cool things to show you. There are lots of reasons our homeless crisis is worse than ever. Has the pandemic made getting help harder? A little bit, yeah. But there's a specific reason why so many are honing in on Delta Park to set up camp. The Clark County law impacting Oregon's homeless crisis when the story continues. Welcome back. Hope you had a chance to, uh, I don't know, send us a little question or comment or something like that using the hashtag HeyDan. Also, email us at the story at KGW.com. I'll be reading some during the break. I uh, just got done reading a few, and we're going to read one right now on the TV show here. A viewer named Roger watched our story on homelessness in Salem last week. He said, your story about the homeless is nothing compared to the camps at Delta Park. Roger, thanks. We appreciate you taking time to write in. Especially appreciate it considering uh, this new poll here from OPB. According to 
this poll released this morning, homelessness is the number one issue on the minds of voters in Portland. Number one, not the virus, not the wildfires, not even the protests, but homelessness. So that in mind, not only do we decide to follow up on Roger's tip, we even went a step further, digging up some old video from our archives of that very site. And tonight, we're going to show you both perspectives, both moments in time. And we want you to ask yourself, has anything changed? Here's Maggie Vespa. Hey, good evening. We know that news about the housing crisis can just be really overwhelming. I mean, right now it's estimated more than 2,000 people are sleeping on the streets of Multnomah County alone. So tonight, we're going to try to make this really simple, and we're going to zero in on one park in Portland. We shot this video driving through Delta Park today. The tents, camps, and RVs go on and on. To give you some context, we shot this video making that same drive four years ago. In August of 2016, this constituted a spike in camping. So much so that then Portland Mayor Charlie Hales was giving people living in their vehicles 72 hours to leave. This woman at the time said getting help was next to impossible. If I don't look like I haven't washed in a month and I don't have a drug problem, then they really don't care. Fast forward back to today. No eviction notices in sight. That said, we noted people technically aren't camping in the park. They're camping just outside of it. Still, it's a consensus. The number of people putting down roots here is skyrocketing. I meet new people probably every day. Like I hear new faces, like new names. I'm like, who's that? Jennifer Talbot blames the reasons you'd expect. Has the pandemic made getting help harder? A little bit, yeah. When we try to make an appointment to go to the licensing place, you could be months out, or doctor's appointment, dentist places. Add historic unemployment, communities ravaged by wildfires, and a shortage of services that existed well before any of that, and people here say, this is what you get. But Joe Lawson cites another reason. The CDC says stay put, and then the sheriff says you got to move. Back in March, at the start of the pandemic, Clark County passed this ordinance, cracking down on people living in their vehicles. He's one of many, he says, who came here from Vancouver. You know, where do we go? I mean, and I, I, I only see it getting worse with, uh, you know, everybody not being able to work and stuff. Since the pandemic began, the city of Portland has pulled back from clearing camps, and both Portland's mayor and his opponent in next month's election are pledging to add more affordable housing and shelter beds. For now, volunteers are delivering donations as much as possible. We saw crews from Cascadia Behavioral Health and the Salvation Army. No one we met at Delta Park thinks this is sustainable. Maggie Vespa, KGW News. U.S. elections have come a long way in nearly two and a half centuries. It really is hard to visualize the Electoral College when it started, initially made up of just 10 states with only 69 electorals total. Now nearly eight times as large, with 538 electors across 50 states. Here's how it worked back then. Each elector received two votes. The person with the majority of votes became president, and the person with the second most became vice president. And forget about political parties or big massive campaigns. President George Washington, for instance, was summoned to serve. Think of it as one giant write-in ballot. If people saw you as a leader, you were granted the position. And it was no contest in 1789. Again, electors had two votes, and every single one of them cast their first vote for Washington, giving him a unanimous victory. And 34 electors cast their second vote to John Adams, giving him a second place finish and the vice presidency. Obviously, things have changed. Perhaps the biggest difference between then and now, the public didn't used to get a vote. As late as 1816, citizens of nine states were not able to cast a ballot. And it wasn't until November 4th, 1845, that the U.S. held its very first uniform election day, meaning all states voted on the same day. Still, though, not all U.S. citizens were given the right to vote until 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was passed. That was just 55 years ago, I should remind you. The legislation ensured that all men and women aged 21 and older, regardless of race, religion, or education, the right to vote without discrimination. A tradition continued today, where every citizen of the United States over the age of 18 has the privilege to cast a ballot, whether by mail or in person. 
A viewer, Emma, wanted us to go a little deeper on who electors actually are. She wrote in part, and asked in part, who elects the electors? Well, Emma, most people can be electors if they want to be. Here's who can't, though. You can't be in Congress or a high-ranking federal official. You also can't be a state official who's engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the U.S., so hopefully that's not you. But a lot of times, electors are just people inside the political world, like party leaders or people who work for state or local governments. And how they're chosen is up to each state's legislature. So most let the parties choose them at the state party convention or by the state party committee. And this means that three are, uh, it means that there are two sets of potential electors chosen for each state. So one of Democrats and one for the Republicans. Whichever party wins the state's popular vote then sends their set of electors to officially vote for their presidential candidate. I think that makes sense, right? I think so. Hey, we're going to finish this story. Try to wrap this thing up by making some sense. We're going to read your comments and questions. Use that hashtag HeyDan during the break and maybe I'll read what you have to say when we come back. I'll see you next to finish the story. All right, hey, let's read some comments. First, this one's coming from Travis. He said, uh, Dan, uh, uh, hey, Dan, to be more specific, renters still do need to pay rent and will owe all of their back rent soon. They just can't be evicted for non-payment right now. Important distinction, very important distinction. You're exactly right. I kind of, I guess I, my language was a little too loose uh, earlier. In fact, there's a lot of conversation right now um, when it comes to the mayoral race or any of these council people, what's going to happen for the people who weren't able to pay rent but still have now that debt? And, you know, the people who own the places where they're renting actually have to pay mortgages, right, and, and property taxes and things like that. So what's going to happen? And uh, the answers I've been hearing from, regardless of who the candidate is, is aid. And whether that's going to be state aid or federal aid, but it's going to be in the form of some type of financial help. But we have to wait to see what happens, of course. We got another one from uh, uh, Kelly. What about the voter stats for Clackamas and Washington counties? Multnomah County is not the only county in Oregon. You are correct, but they have been the most responsive to us so far. Maybe they have the biggest return so far, but we are asking everybody, and we're just telling you the numbers that we can report from them. And uh, on the story, Twitter account where she sent that in, they responded to her and said Washington County voter turnout has been at 8.45%. So we haven't seen any numbers from Clackamas County, but we'll continue to ask those questions. We just kind of want to keep everybody updated on how much people are voting early right now because there's been such a push to do so. So um, that's the story for tonight. We appreciate you being with us. The news at 6.30 is next. Stick around and hang out with Laurel Porter for a half hour. She's the best. We'll see you tomorrow.